So we are going to hear from Steve Hamburg tonight. Um, I was really excited because after four and a half years of birding, I'm up to 370 birds and hope to pick up another 100 or so next week or more. And so I thought, oh, wow, I'm really getting up there. And then um, I'm only like 7,000 plus birds behind Steve Hamburg. So. <laughs> <laughs> your success is measured by your own um, your own effort, I think, um, and time in, involved. So I'm really learning, eager to learn from his experience tonight. Maybe he'll tell us how many birds he really does have. And apparently, he has the largest world list of anybody that lives in Michigan. So any for Michigan birders that are on eBird anyway. Um, and he's got a whole lot of credentials in science and medicine and lots of other things um, and I'm eager to hear how all of that brought him to you Canada. So thank you Steve. Thank you. Looking forward. Well uh, thanks for having me. I think this is uh, the, uh, probably the third time I've been uh, at this uh, uh, organization's meetings and uh, I always enjoy that. Uh, so uh, thanks for having me again. Um, I am one of those guys who goes birding around the world, and uh, I'm leaving on Friday for another trip. Uh, I'm going to Bolivia. It'll be country number 91 for me. And uh, and yes, I have a fairly sizable list. I, at the present time, uh, my world list is 7,560. So, um, I uh, anyway. But that's not why I go birdie. I, I used to really, really get after those numbers, but I, you know, as time goes on, the numbers become less important, and it's just, it's just an enjoyable thing to do is to, to go uh, looking at birds. Um, let's see what. Okay. Um, now, when I go birding, uh, I usually, you know. Go with a professional group. Now you can do it another way. You can go on your on your own and try to look for birds yourself. Uh, personally, I find that uh, uses up a lot of valuable time because you you have to figure out where you're going to stay, how you're going to get around, where you're going to eat, you know, all those logistics. But if you sign up with a professional birding tour group, then uh, they take care of all of those logistics. So you just have to go along. And not only that, but they often provide a leader or a guide who knows the bird's cold. And so, like, if you're struggling to identify a particular bird, he can help you. And so, uh, so I, I really uh, find that more efficient, although it is more expensive to do it. That way. <laughs> so I guess you have to choose. Uh, well, tonight we're going to go to Uganda, okay? And uh, this is during the heart of COVID. I did this trip two years ago. And uh, there weren't many places you could go two years ago. Most of the countries had closed their borders to uh, tourists. And, uh, but in U Uganda was in East Africa. And the East African countries seemed to get hit less hard with the COVID. Uh, they didn't have that many cases, uh, at least at the time when I uh, uh, signed up. Um, they, there was a theory that maybe they had had a virus uh, of some kind that had some similarities to the COVID virus. And so most of the people might have been immune, they weren't sure. But anyway, uh, I, I signed up to go uh, to Uganda during that time. And that, uh, that was a really good choice. Well, where is Uganda? Well, Uganda is in East Africa. Uh, there's uh, several countries that are surrounding it. And just point them out, this is Kenya. Tanzania, Rwanda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, used to be known as Zaire, and then Sudan there. So those are the countries uh, surrounding it. And there's another really important border of Uganda, and that is this border right here. That's Lake Victoria. Now, we have the Great Lakes in the United States. Well, Africa also has a set of Great Lakes. They're not as big as the ones that we have here, but still sizable. Uh, and those lakes are caused by the separation of two tectonic plates. Uh, and they're slowly, slowly, slowly separating and the depression that they create then uh, fills up with water and has made these lakes. And so Lake Victoria is one, but also Lake Albert, 
Lake Edward, you go a little bit further south and it's Lake Tanganyika, and a little bit further south of that is Lake Malawi. So they're all kind of in a line and uh, uh, are known as the African Great Lakes. Another uh, interesting fact about the waterways in Uganda is, is that the Nile River, the famous Nile River, starts right here in Lake Victoria. That is the source of the Nile River. It, the Nile will then cross all the way through Uganda, go into Sudan. It will continue its way northward and get into Egypt and eventually empty into the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, there is another natural lake right here, Lake Kyoga, uh, that uh, is fed by the uh, uh, Ugandan Nile. Well, we're gonna start uh, our trip. You know, when you go on these tours, you wanna see as many of the birds that the country has to offer. So what you have to do is you have to keep moving around. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna keep moving around. We're gonna start here. I put orange circles, kind of let you know about where we are in the country. Uh, uh, Kampala is the capital city. Uh, you, when you fly to Kampala, you don't land there. You land in Entebbe. That's where the airport is, Entebbe. And uh, so we flew into Entebbe, and then uh, we were picked up by a taxi, and we uh, uh, went to this hotel. And, and, and another thing, people always ask me, what kind of places do you stay in when you go to a country like this? Well. To answer those kind of questions, I've thrown in a few pictures of places that we've stayed. So you, you kind of get an idea. It's really not that bad, it's pretty good. Uh, we, do, we do see that there's walls around this uh, hotel and that they have guards. Uh, they're, they're just trying to keep people out uh, who don't belong there. Um, but the, we didn't really experience any trouble at all. This was the sort of the place where I stayed. It was decent. Had a nice patio off to the side. And uh, this is my room now. The room wasn't all that luxurious. But, you know, got a good night's sleep. Did the job. First day, uh, we're gonna go for the most important bird of the entire trip. That's the shoebill. Now the shoebill is a really odd looking bird. I mean, that thing is prehistoric looking. It uh, stands about maybe four foot tall. Uh, looks a little bit like a heron. It's not exactly a heron. It's got this huge bill on it, uh, and it lives in papyrus swamps. Well, okay, so we're gonna start in a swamp. Uh, Uganda is probably the best place in the world to see that bird. It does occur a little bit in some of the surrounding countries, but, but Uganda is the best place to go. And in Uganda, this is the best spot to find it. So here we are, we, we start out in our uh, little boats and you can see the papyrus along here. That papyrus is the same, well, it's in the same family as this famous papyrus that the Egyptians used to use, you know, where they, they used to write their hieroglyphics on papyrus scrolls. Well, they used that species of papyrus so much that it actually went extinct. So it doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. This is a, a relative of that particular papyrus uh, that's still around. Here we are leaving the, uh, the, the boat launch, the papyrus. I might mention also uh, on this, that on this, in this particular trip, we had, um, uh, six passengers, so a nice small group. Uh, most of the time we have British people. I usually go with a British company, but uh, at the time of COVID, they weren't letting any British people out of their country. So they couldn't go, uh, which would turn out to be a good thing for me. Uh, but uh, no, we had three Americans on this trip and we had uh, a German guy, a Swedish guy, a Finnish lady, and uh, the leader was uh, from Belgium. So here we are, we're looking for, for birds, seeing if we can find a shoe bill. Beautiful uh, scenery in this nice uh, 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 area with uh, lots of lily pads.
And we did see birds like the sacred ibis. Uh, it's called the sacred ibis because uh, the Egyptians used to worship this bird. Uh, the, one of their gods had a head like this bird. And uh, they even had temples where they would mummify uh, some of these uh, ibises. But uh, sacred ibis. Long-toed lapwing. Big, long legs to walk around in the swamps. And this was a really good bird to find. This is a, a lesser moorhen. You can kind of see that uh, the common moorhen will have those, those white feathers on the side. Uh, this is the lesser moorhen. And this bird is not seen very often. I've been on a couple of trips where it was possible, but never saw them before. But we saw a few of them on this particular trip. So that was good. Red-headed lovebird. Cute little bird. He's just about six inches long. Was hanging out by the uh, areas where we launched boats. And great blue taracco. I love taracos. Taracos are one of my favorite bird categories. Uh, they're big birds. Uh, they're they're uh, nicely colored. Uh, they're a little raucous. The, their, their calls are not all that pretty, but still, I think they're kind of cool birds. All right, well, serious problem. We did not find a shoe. We were on we were in the swamps for five hours on that boat. No shoe bill. We uh, were told that normally it takes about one hour, maybe an hour and a half, to find a shoe bill. We were on the, on the water five hours, nothing, and we were really uh, not happy. <laughs> and, and but our guide kept saying, "Look, look, uh, I know it was the best spot to find it, and." And, you know, we didn't we didn't score on that, but you might get another chance uh, when we go up here. There's a, a waterfall place up here, uh, and we'll do another boat trip, and you have a have another chance at seeing it. It's not as good, but you might see it up there. So, all right. Steve, Steve, you got a question. Man. Yes. Could you give us an idea as to the size of Uganda and perhaps even the uh, diameter in miles of the uh, orange spot? Uh, well, the orange spot is uh, artificially put on by me, well, and I, so I have no. Represent you minus. know, you know, nobody's ever asked me that question. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It, it. Well, uh, let me tell you this. Okay, um, it, it normally should take about two hours to go from Entebbe to Jinja. Okay, and unfortunately, it took more than two hours because <laughs> you have to go past Kampala. And the traffic is absolutely horrendous. They've got like one main road, it's two lane. And so you can only go as fast as the, as the, as the guys in front of you. And, and a lot of times there are slow trucks, et cetera. So I, I'm not sure I can really answer your question any better than that. Is it I'm, gonna look it up. Of, I'm gonna look it up when I get home. Size of Oregon. It's the size of Oregon, yeah. <laughs> okay, there you go. Size, uh, you got it about the size of Oregon. <laughs> Good to know. Steve, I have a question too. Yes. What is the language? I noticed that your first shot of the place you stayed, it was in English on yeah. the sign. Yeah, it, it, it was an English uh, protectorate for a long time. The English, English people colonized Uganda. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the main, the biggest tribe is the Bugandans. And so they speak that language. Mm -hmm. And Steve, when you answer questions, could you repeat the questions so that they get picked up on the Facebook right. Live for okay. viewers uh, at home? Uh, yes. Well, um, the, okay, the question was, uh, what language did they speak? Because the, the uh, person noticed that there was English on a sign. Well, English is the common language there because it was an English colony at one point, and uh, so a lot of the English culture got uh, established there. Also, there are several tribes. Well, you can't you can't pick one language from one tribe and make the other tribe happy. So if you if you pick English, they can all speak English. And so so it makes uh, sense to, to use that. Steve, could you, 
Could you spell the name of that elusive bird, big bird? The shoe bill? Yeah. Like shoe, as in S H O E B I L L. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And you will see why they call it that. Okay. So, oh, good. All right. Now, one of the things I like to do when I'm traveling is I'll just I'll just point my camera out the window of the vehicle I'm traveling in so that you see what I see. Okay. I'm taking you along on this trip. Okay. So that's that's uh, that's the way I, I like to work it. And these are just typical scenes from almost anywhere in Africa. Uh, you wouldn't know exactly what country you were in just by looking at this. Because they all look similar. And I included this to kind of give you an idea how fast we were traveling. <laughs> knew some shortcuts, so we were cutting through markets and alleyways and everything, it was just incredible. Um, but he cut two hours off the uh, off the trip, so it took us only six hours. Yeah. Arrived in Jinja, and we go, wow, this is really not, you know, a nice place. My room, I had a nice balcony, looking up over at, uh, this is Lake Victoria in the distance here, and right here is where the Nile River starts. It was up that way. So I had a really nice location. But one thing about birding trips is that you, even though you stay in some nice places sometimes, uh, you don't ever get to enjoy them. <laughs> because you often arrive after dark, or at least too late to go and you do any more birding in the day. And then you get up before dawn so that you can be on the site at sunrise and so you never you never get to enjoy the, the places. My wife always used to complain about that. Okay, we're gonna cro we're crossing the Nile River here, and uh, there's a nearby forest that we're gonna visit. And in that forest, we see the white-headed wood hoople. Kind of an interesting looking bird. And this is a, a yellow mantled weaver. Now, I don't know if you if you've never been to Africa, you probably never watched weavers. But weavers are fascinating birds to watch because they will make these nests. They will take strips of grass and then they'll start making a circle with it and attach that circle to a branch and then they'll make another circle, another circle, and keep attaching them to the branch. And then eventually they'll take grass and they'll weave it around that framework of circles. And they'll make kind of a nest that reminds you a little bit like an oriole nest, only it's not this long hanging down thing. It's, it's, a, it's more of a round ball. Really, really fascinating. Most of the weavers are, are uh, yellowish. This one happens to be one of the blackish ones, the yellow mantled weaver. <coughs> so black and white cast hornbill. Big bird, about three feet long. Really amazing. And this is a special bird for me uh, because this was bird, my bird number 7,000. Okay. This is uh, the red-headed Malimbe, and I thought that was kind of cool to get, uh, to get uh, a good-looking bird for a milestone bird. That's, that was great. All right, on we go. So we're going to go up to Soroti here, but we really want to go to Morocco. Now, there were reports from the previous year that there was a, a bird there called the fox's weaver. The fox's weaver uh, is a bird that migrates around. It'll stay in one spot for maybe two or three or four years nesting and then all of a sudden they disappear and they'll appear in another place stay there for two three or four years and, and so you never really know where they're going where they're going to end up and uh, 
as a consequence, they're not often seen on birding tours. Well, there were reports that there were some there at Maroto. Well, the previous year, a group tried to go there, but it's somewhat in a rural area, and the rural people there saw these white guys showing up with binoculars, looking around, looking very suspicious, and uh, they were worried that they were gonna take land from them. Mm -hmm. you know, so so they, they got really angry and they, they made the birders leave, and the birders never saw that that uh, foxes weaver. Okay, so we're gonna make another try this year, and the, what we did is they, they managed to connect with one guy from that area, somebody that those people there would recognize. And we let him bird with us for about a day, and then so that he could see what we're doing and, and, and what we're after, and so that he could then explain it to the people when we got there. But uh, and there's no hotel up there, so we have to stay in Sorote anyway. So we're going to go there first. You can see that the area is getting a little more re uh, remote. Still nice. And we arrived at the Sorote Hotel, and here we are unloading my room. And this is sort of the backside of the hotel, and we're not gonna talk about the fact that I got lost trying to find supper that night <laughs> in, this, in this maze. Uh, anyway, next morning we got up and uh, headed out towards Moroto. And uh, these are just some scenes along the road. You see a lot of people like this walking, especially in the early hours of the morning. Uh, some of these are school kids that are on their way to school. Uh, they don't have buses, you have to walk. And, uh, and some of these are just people going to visit their aunt or uncle or some friend, but it's cooler in the morning, so the morning is the time to go. And there are uh, some people who have uh, motorbikes, and that's a common thing to see. Uh, you can fit maybe two, or three people on a motorbike. You can, if you've got kids, you can get four or five. <laughs> I've seen as many as six on, on one motorbike. I saw one where they, they put a two by four crosswise <laughs> so that one kid could sit on one side, another, and then a, a third one in the middle. It was really amazing. Uh, but this is a common, common way to get around. Uh, some guys own more bikes, and that's what they do. To they they, they charge maybe uh, you know a few cents to one of their uh, fellow townsmen to uh, take them someplace. Well, we arrived on our spot, and we had absolutely no trouble. I mean, we were prepared for it, but fortunately, we did not have any trouble. We saw birds like the yellow uh, longbill. And uh, this was a good bird to find. This is the, the Karamoja apolis. Uh, this bird has a very limited range. So if you look in a guidebook, uh, the area where he lives is really small. I, I think what's more amazing about this are the thorns. <laughs> yes, there's a question. Well, he looks like a northern shrike, right? A little bit. And there he's sitting in a branch with thorns. Do you yeah. Does he impale his prey? You know? Uh, no, I, I no? don't think this. Okay, the question is, does this bird impale prey on the thorns? No, not that I'm aware of. Well, okay. thorns are... it's, a, it's a much more docile species of bird. Thank you. Okay. Uh, these thorns are amazing, and you want to stay away from them. <laughs> <laughs> they will go right through you. Uh, they, I, I remember I lived in I lived in Southern Africa for four years, and there was one time when I my wife and I took our car to a, a game reserve in South Africa, and there was a stand of trees like this with those thorns like that, and in the subsequent twelve months, I had not one, but twelve flat tires. So those those thorns are just amazing. 
And then we got to see this bird. This bird is another one of those birds that's never seen. This is the dwarf bittern. And usually he lives in swamps and he just stays still like a normal bittern. You know, he just stays still and you know, with his colors, he just blends right in, stays in the shadows and you never see him. But we were walking along and there was a ditch you know, and this guy flew out of the ditch mm -hmm. up into a tree right in front of us and basically posed for us. I mean, this is what he looks like. It's amazing. And this is the famous fox's weaver. So, not a particularly spectacular bird, but a very rare bird. Yeah, well, that's the kind of habitat he likes to live in, I guess. Uh, the uh, this fox's weaver is the only bird in Uganda that is endemic to that country. Um, all right, now we're going to move on. <coughs> and some more scenes along the way. You see this kind of thing a lot in Africa where uh, people are just sitting along the road, but you see they've got piles of coconuts here. Those are for sale. Uh, there's some mangoes here. There's some bananas here. And uh, those people will just sit along the road all day long and sort of socialize. And somebody traveling along the road, they, if they're thirsty, uh, you can stop, you buy a coconut, they'll lock the, the coconut open with a machete and then you can have your drink right straight from the husk. Is it safe to purchase produce from a roadside stand? Uh, well, yes, but you have to wash it. You have to. Is it safe to use the uh, to buy things from the roadside stand? Yes. The general rule is if you can boil it, peel it, or or cook it, it's okay. But uh, like if you if you buy uh, mangoes, you're going to peel it. If you buy bananas, you're going to peel it. Uh, coconuts, you're 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 going to get inside the fruit. So generally. Those kind of things are okay. If you buy tomatoes, for example, that might be a little bit more dicey. Uh, but if you if you do buy them, then you like to wash them and clean them very well. Yes, another question. Um, did you say what time of year you were here? I was here in June. Okay. In June, yeah. The, the time of year that uh, I was here was uh, June of 2021. So that's the dry season, perhaps? Yeah, it's, yeah. Because uh, to try to go birding during the wet season is like asking for trouble. A hot card game here. <laughs> I think it was mango season. <laughs> yeah, it was mango season. <laughs> Crossing the Nile again. And here we come to Murchison Falls National Park. Now Murchison Falls is one of the great, spectacular, natural wonders of Uganda. And I somehow expected a much more spectacular entrance <laughs> to it, but this is what they had. I mean, it's okay, it's nice. And here we are uh, paying our fees to get into the, into the park. This is what we traveled in here. This was a, a uh, glorified Land Rover. Uh, it had an extended back on it so that it could uh, take 10 passengers. And I will say that uh, the four-wheel drive came in handy a number of times. <laughs> Once you got into this park, though, the roads were fabulous. And there's nobody on them. Well, practically nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we looked around and we thought, wow, hey, you know, we see this is how you must do it. So that's what we did. <laughs> so uh, we went birding here uh, along the road for a while and once in a while we'd get off the road onto a path and uh, we saw some of these uh, this phenomenon uh, a couple of times uh, during our trip we saw this anybody know what's going on here Puddling. drinking the drinking water no well they're drinking but it's not exactly water some animal has urinated here and so there a urine is high in a chemical compound known as urea and 
the butterflies seem to need urea uh, and they sort of, when there is a spot of concentrated urea, they will come to it and drink up. Kind of gross, but. <laughs> All right, so here we come to Murchison Falls and it, it, just, just to kind of give you an idea. picture of <laughs> tourists in front of the falls. And this is right as the water goes over the end. And uh, looking downstream. Outside my room here, and we were warned: do not leave the sliders of your patio open because this guy right here is just waiting for an opening. And I remember being on a trip to Kenya one time when they gave us the same warning, and one of the guys in our group did not heed the warning. He left his his slider open. And when we came back from birding, it was like a tornado had gone through that room. Absolutely everything was upside down and torn apart. It was just a total mess. So anyway, I heeded the warning. They had a beautiful patio where you could look out and listen to the hippos calling at night. Well, those aren't real hippos there. <laughs> We're gonna take a boat ride today here. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna make another go at trying to find the shoe bill. And as I said, there's lots of hippos in Uganda. Some of the birds seem to enjoy the hippos too. You saw the uh, fish eagle, the African fish eagle, is uh, very similar to the American bald eagle, except that the white goes much further down on the chest. But the habits are the same, they eat fish. Got to see this bird, the little bitter. About as easy to find as a least bitter. Well, we have now spent four more hours on the water. <laughs> so nine hours altogether, and we still have not seen a shoe bill. We are really disappointed. So that we always have a, a local guide with us, uh, one of the Africans, and he goes, he's got to thinking, he says, you know, May it was really rainy and the water levels are kind of high at this time, this time. And Maybe it's too deep along the bank for the shoe bells to feed. So he said, I suggest we try going out of the park and just drive along the road. And there, there's lots of marshy areas along the road. Maybe one of the shoe bells 
and who can be found in that. So we went out of the park. And within 10 minutes of being out of the park, we came across this family of elephants. But we hadn't seen elephants at this point, so we decided to sit and watch them as they're eating in the marsh. When one of the elephants moved, and behind the elephant <laughs> was a shuga. Let me tell you, there was a lot of celebration. A lot of hooping and hollering and high fives. Yeah, life was good again. I think you have to agree that is the weirdest looking. <laughs> Isn't he cute? <laughs> Got this huge bill here. He eats big fish, you know. So there's there's nothing else that eats fish that size. So he can scoop those things up. He eat a whole tilapia in one gulp, you know. It's just really, really uh, no problem for him. And he's got a nice hook on the front to make sure that fish doesn't get away. And I think they realized that. They're not that great looking, so they put this crest on them just to, <laughs> to kind of keep them, make them a little more. How tall, please? About four feet. Yeah. Stand about four feet tall. Well, we're in. Okay, now that we've seen the shoe wheel, we can relax a little bit, and we're in the East African plains. So they have a lot of the animals uh, that the East Africa has. And so we went out watching the animals for a while. And we're also bird watching at the same time. The giraffe here, and there's a couple of warthogs right there. You can see. And there was a Pacas monkey sitting on a termite hill there just supervising the tourists as they went by. Dick Dick, this thing is only about a foot and a half tall, a small antelope. Wanted to keep buffalo, cooling themselves off in the water. Temperature on a day like this is maybe in the mid 80s. Uh, it really wasn't bad. But in the sun, they like to cool themselves off. Okay, it gets to be lunchtime. This is what you do. Is uh, it's a lot. It's going to take a long time to go back to a hotel, order order lunch, and then come all the way back. We're going to waste a lot of time. So what we do is we have the hotel pack us uh, food to put in a box and take with us. And when it gets to be lunchtime, we just put a couple of towels on the hood of the vehicle and pull out the food and help ourselves. Works pretty good. Well, they had some forested areas here in this park, too, so we're going to see what we can see. And we saw birds like uh, the beautiful sunbird. That's his actual name, beautiful sunbird. And uh, sunbirds, I might mention, are the eastern half of the world's answer to the western half of the world's hummingbirds. So they don't have hummingbirds in the eastern half of the world. They, they have sunbirds. They're small. They, they drink nectar. They pollinate the, the, uh, the flowers. But they don't have that special wing structure. They just have a wing structure a lot like a normal bird. <laughs> Yellow-fronted tinker bird. About a sparrow-sized bird. <clears throat> Chocolate-backed kingfisher. <coughs> and a nice butterfly. All right, moving on. Going through some more towns. Now, 2021 was an election year in Uganda. And this, we saw lots of posters for this guy. Now, um, some people have complained that he's corrupt and that he has influences on the elections. Now, I don't know about that. 
but I do know that he's been president of the country passing every single election since 1986. <laughs> so you figure it out. <laughs> Going through a market. This is my room here. Nice luxury accommodations. The air conditioning system right there. The reason we stopped at this place is because of this road here. This is called the Royal Mile. Now, the back in the days of the Ugandan kings, uh, the, the Bugandan king would come here and he would have this great big procession and all these people would follow him down this road about a mile and then they get to a creek at which time the king performed some ceremonies which I couldn't even tell you what they were like but some, and then he would come back well, that's what they did before. They don't have kings anymore, so they don't use this area for it anymore. But because of its historical significance, they have reserved this area of land. And because of that, it, the trees are great. It's great for bird. This is a, a the African emerald cuckoo. He's a fairly small bird, probably about, oh, I would say cardinal size, maybe robin size. Um, and he's absolutely beautiful. I mean, this, this green here just shimmers in the light when he, when he turns. And he's got that beautiful yellow breast. Uh, trouble is, he's a cuckoo. And cuckoos, uh, their behavior is a little bit like cowbirds. They do not raise their own young. They lay their eggs in somebody else's nest. The uh, Rufus flycatcher thrush. They have brown birds too. <laughs> the lowland masked apples. All right, moving on. I should throw this slide out. I take sometimes I take what I call reality sh the reality <laughs> slot the pictures. Okay. You know, some people, they, they try to get the really best shot possible and then, you know, the frame is just right. I'm just pointing my camera out the window here. This is what I saw, probably with dirt on the window. Another nice place to stay that we didn't spend much time at. Well, today we're gonna go for a special bird. It's called the green-breasted pitta. I don't know if any of you have been to South America or Central America. There's, there's some uh, birds that are called ant pittas. Uh, they are notorious for being skulkers. You, I mean, they are really hard to find. Well, the eastern half of the world doesn't have ant pittas. They have pittas. Uh, now, ant pittas tend to be more brown and gray and rufous but the pittas are a lot more colorful. So they're, they're a little bit more interesting in my opinion, but they're just as hard to find. So we're gonna go trying to find one of those today. <laughs> well, we didn't go very far and we came across a, uh, a family of chimpanzees. Now I've never seen chimpanzees in the wild and this was really a cool thing to run across them. Uh, they weren't so happy with our presence. They seemed more annoyed, and this was what the way that one of those chimps showed his displeasure. <laughs> uh, we spent the whole morning, no green-breasted pitta. So we decided to do something else in the afternoon, so we just birded along the road. Oh. Saw so birds like the black bee eater. I mean, this is an absolutely stunning bird. Uh, you know, those, those colors, just really, really pretty. <laughs> the crested guinea fowl. Uh, the, a few of you may have seen the helmeted guinea fowl. They sometimes graze them like chickens on, 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 on farms, but this is a cousin of it, the crested guinea fowl. He's got more hair on top of it. 
<laughs> and uh, cute little yellow bellied wax bills. Well, we did find the green breasted pit at that day, so we're going to come back for one more morning, make another attempt. And um, we spent a couple of hours trying to find it and no bird. So we decided to take a different tack. And what we did is we had, we took a couple of park rangers with us and we just sent them out in different directions. And the plan was for us just to wait. And, and the thought was, you know, with a group of six people, maybe it was, we were scaring the bird off a little bit. So, so with one person, they're gonna try to see once they find it. Once they find it, they're gonna call to us. So we waited at this spot for about an hour. And sure enough, uh, one of the guys called to us and we went running and <coughs> the underbrush. I mean, we're, we're brushing aside branches and we're jumping over lo uh, fallen logs and trying not to trip on vines. And just, we're just working just to get there. And we got there and there's that bird. <laughs> the bird is not a very clear picture, but I'm just happy to have it. Uh, you can kind of get an idea, uh, you know, it is much more colored, the green breast here. And uh, uh, that, was, that was awesome that we managed to find this bird. While I'm watching this bird, I came to the sad realization that the glasses that were on my face before I started running oh. were no longer on my face. <laughs> and Judging by the terrain that we just gone through, it was hopeless to try to look for them. I had lost my glasses. Fortunately, I had a spare pair in my backpack back in the hotel. What was the name of that last bird? The Green Breasted Pitta. That was the name. Pitta is P I T T A. Another fantastic photo. <laughs> But I included it just so you get a sense of what the, the terrain looks like. Passing through a town. You know, I didn't notice this um, before I came home and looked through my photos, but right there I could have stopped. It's glasses. <laughs> Way to see that sign at the time. <laughs> this is how you move your cab. Put them in the back of your pickup truck. Now here's another spot. I expected a whole lot more fanfare than, than what we had. I mean, we're crossing the equator. I mean, you know, that's a big deal, right? Yeah. You know, but but it's just this little bitty sign. I suppose because there's not many tourists that come out this way and you know maybe it's no big deal to the locals <laughs> so maybe that's why the sign's not so big and we finally get to Lake Edward and it's it in the distance there and this is what it looks like in the other direction and we drive into Queen Elizabeth Park now, back in 1952, Queen Elizabeth, who, by the way, died, what, last year? <laughs> Queen Elizabeth, in 1952, uh, she learned that her father had just passed away and that she was now queen. And she learned that at this very spot right here. <laughs> So that's why they, they renamed the park. I don't know what it was before, but they renamed the park Queen Elizabeth Park after her. Notice also that now we're in two vehicles. And that's because the president had come on the TV a couple of nights before and announced that the number of COVID cases had taken a dramatic increase and they were going to institute restrictions. They were closing all the schools. They were, they were shutting down public transportation. You were not allowed to cross county lines. So if you lived in one county and worked on the other, in another county, you had to make a choice. Do you, do you live at work and 
continue to work or do you live at home and not go to work for until however long it is till they lift the restrictions. And uh, only one person allowed on a motorbike. You had to socially distance, so they still allowed four people in a car. Okay, so we've got six passengers, uh, an African guy uh, who's driving, and also uh, our Belgian guy. So, so we've got eight people, so we had to have two vehicles uh, to do this. Fortunately, they were not going to make restrictions for the tourists in crossing county lines. We could still go wherever we wanted to. But they, we did have to pass by many, many police checks. And they're always checking to make sure that you are not crossing the county lines if you're a resident. This is the lodge at uh, Queen Elizabeth Park, quite nice. The lobby has that sort of colonial type feel. Mm -hmm. My room. Next day, we're out looking for our birds. And we also saw some animals. This is a Ugandan cob, K O B. Ugandan cob. It is similar to an impala, but it has a lot more white on it than what the impala does, and it's missing one of the, the stripe along the flank, uh, and it's slightly bigger in size. Saw a number of elephants in this park. I always like watching elephants. It, we're along a line of volcanoes here, and uh, this is an extinct volcano. This was the crater at one time. Now has a little sort of a lake that's partially dried up in the middle. White-backed vultures resting in the tree. Got back to camp and there's a group of banded mongoose raiding our trash cans. <laughs> well, we had a nice lunch this time. Uh, I got to actually eat on a table and a uh, and, uh, beautiful view. The breeze was nice, temperature was nice, and we're sitting right next to this nice water, this uh, swimming pool, and we started having thoughts about skipping birding in the afternoon. <laughs> but our leader wouldn't have it. We had to go on a boat trip. We know more than left the, the dock and we went past this bank and it's just peppered with holes. Here. And those are the holes of the pied kingfisher. Uh, I've seen a number of pied kingfishers. Uh, I've been to Africa a number of times and I've, they're not unusual to see, but I've never seen so many in one place in my life. A little further, uh, then we saw this animal on the, on the shore, we couldn't identify it, so we, so we came in closer. And it turns out it, it's a giant forest hawk. I've never seen one before. I didn't even know they existed until this trip. They're obviously related to a warthog, but much bigger, probably two or three times the size of a warthog, and they've got these gigantic warts on their face. Just as ugly. <laughs> Spur wing, lap wing there. Spotted hyena. Cape buffalo. More elephants. Just to kind of give you an idea of the density of animals here, I just did this. I just scanned the bank. Lots of animals here. Is this like a game reserve? Um, yeah, it's a. Yeah, this is a. This is a game reserve. It's there's a. 
a channel that goes from uh, Lake George to Lake Edward called the Gazinga Channel. And that's what we're on. The line closing in 24 minutes. Uh oh. Uh oh. Shutting down. And it's 745. Are, are we uh, bound by that? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, take it back. <laughs> All right, DeFaz's water buck. And we managed to see a pair of African fish eagles copulating. <laughs> and talk about time. <laughs> Unbelievable. There's a, a whole group of skimmers on this bank. And uh, as we started getting close, we flushed them. Skimmers are really cool. If you, if, if you can kind of see that, I don't know, it's kind of hard to see in this. But the lower part of the bill, the lower mandible, is longer than the upper mandible. So this bird will fly close to the water, dragging that lower mandible in the water, trolling. And then when he hits a fish, bang, just snap shut his bill and he's got plumps, just like that. Is that a different species than the ones we have here? In yeah, the yeah, there's a the species. We have, we have black, uh, skimmers. black skimmers in the United States. And they look very similar, but these are African skimmers, a little bit different species. Yeah. And the behavior is the same. And here, I, I said we flushed them. Oh. Yeah, we don't need to watch this whole thing, I'll just speed it up. <laughs> Quite a spectacle. Really, really kind of cool. Well, we went uh, a little bit further. There's another group of uh, skimmers on the bank here with a few pied kingfishers hanging out. Uh, right next to this guy here. This is a Goliath heron. He stands about five feet tall. I mean, it's a huge bird. Goliath heron. Saw a few of these guys. In this group of birds, you've got white pelicans here. Uh, you've got some great cormorants right here. And then you've got this bird here. This cute looking guy right there. Uh, this is a marabou stork. And uh, he's got this great pouch that he hangs down there. That seems to be attractive to the opposite sex. And it, he's breeding season because I can see he's got that red patch on his back there. And he has gray legs. Well, he's, 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 he's on his knees right here. But he's, his legs are gray, but these look more white. And the reason that they look white is because it's been hot out. And part of his cooling system includes defecating on his feet. And so, you know, if you've ever had the privilege of being under a bird when he's gone over you and managed to defecate on you, uh, you know, get this liquidy, oily stuff. Well, same thing here. There's liquidy, oily, uh, but that when that liquid evaporates, it, it takes uh, heat away from uh, the body. Strange, but it works. More craters. Mm -hmm. Extinct volcano that now is all vegetated over. We saw birds like African crake. That's, a, that's not an easy bird to see. African crake. And this one is even harder to see, the blue quail. You got lucky with this one. Nubian woodpecker. Southern red fishing. You might see some of these in these aviaries that they have, you know, in some buildings around here. Beautiful sunset. Hippos are calling in the distance. <laughs> Next day, we're going to leave the park. On the way out, we see Topi, a big antelope. 
And uh, we drive for a while and we, it's lunchtime, so we pulled off in this roadside park and uh, had our lunch. And uh, you look, there's a river right down there. That is the border between Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's another country on the other side of that river. And there's lots of hippos there. You can see one was involved in some kind of altercation here. I'm not sure how he's going to do with that huge gash this side. These were some of the hippos on the other bank. Uh, and again, it's hard to see, but they've got several ox peckers walking around on their backs. Ox peckers are related to starlings, but what they will do is they will they will pick off ticks and parasites off the backs and skin of, of a lot of animals. And there's a love-hate relationship uh, between uh, those birds and the animals. Because birds will take away the parasites, but they also are a real nuisance to the animal when they start crawling inside the ears and getting into the eyes and the nose. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, a little bit further, a family of open-billed storks. And this shows a closer view of an open-billed stork. You see why I call him open bill, because his bill doesn't really close all the way, but it's perfect shape for picking up these big giant snails that live in the water and also clams, freshwater clams. And so that's what they eat. And uh, that bill is perfectly designed for that. Now we're, um, we've gone to another national park called uh, the Bwindi Impenetrable Forest National Park. <coughs> the impenetrable forest sounds intimidating. Well, they call it impenetrable for two reasons. One is the, the, it's really dense underbrush. And the other reason is uh, because it's so hilly here that it just is hard work to, to go through it. Nice place this was. They had a little balcony and we sat and birded from the balcony for a while. Saw birds like the collared sunbird. Black hooded oriole. And here's another one of my favorite types of birds. This is a, the Rosses Turaco. Rosses Turaco. And this, this place is uh, famous for its um, gorillas. So you can come here and see gorillas in the wild. Well, we're gonna look for birds first. And you always have to be ready for rain because it can rain, so you have to have an umbrella or rain gear with you all the time. So birds like narrow-tailed starlet, Blue-headed sunbird. Looter's bush shrike. And here we're seeing some more of those butterflies going for the urea. You can see several species of butterflies. <coughs> they all want the same thing. Well, this is a picture of a Silverback gorilla. Now I took this off the internet. <laughs> okay. Now, um, we had the option to go looking for gorillas or to go birding. Now, I had seen gorillas a number of years before. I'd been to the uh, Zaire at the time, and uh, I had seen gorillas there. In fact, uh, we had come across a family and uh, we had uh, one of the big males like this charges. Now, if that doesn't stop your heart, I don't know what will. But, but we saw this gorilla <coughs> beat his chest and then just come racing toward us. And we were under strict instructions not to move a muscle. Because if you don't move, you're probably okay. But if you move at all, that 
gorilla will come after you. So, so uh, I had had such an experience. I didn't think that could be taught. Uh, and, and besides, it's $700 for a half a day of watching, uh, looking for gorillas. And I decided that I think I would rather go bird watching this time. So I went bird watching. Uh, three of us went bird watching. The other three went looking for gorillas, and they did. They did find a family of gorillas, and uh, they said it was a really nice experience. Nobody got charged on that episode, though. Why? <laughs> While out uh, looking for birds, we saw the dusty, long-tailed coot. This is a big. It's a bigger coot. <laughs> The Willard's City Boo Boo. I love that name, Boo Boo. It's a B O U B O U, Boo Boo. Now we're all back together. Good looking bridge there. Guardrails are in really good shape. <laughs> And uh, we came across this earthworm. I had to take a picture of it. I left shoes in it to give you the size of it. Here's this earthworm. Look at that. It was all the way like that. thing was huge. All right, we're gonna go for another uh, really uh, uh, rare bird here. Uh, it's called the Grower's Broadbill, also known as the African Green Broadbill. Really, uh, really rare bird, not often seen, uh, but was known to be in this area here for the last several months. So we're gonna go looking for it. Now the only trouble is, uh, we have to walk downhill to find it. Now downhill doesn't sound so bad, except it's 2,000 feet downhill. Okay, as you might think about it, uh, it's 2,000 feet downhill and then it's 2,000 feet up there after the hand. To give you perspective, it's about 10 feet per story, so that'd be like a 200 story building. Attention line location, the weather will be closing in 12 minutes. Well, we did see the bird. Thank you. We did see the bird, and it was quite an effort. Uh, again, we took that same tactic where we sent out scouts looking for the bird, and then they called to us but this bird didn't stick around that long. So, so by the time we'd get there, the bird would already be gone and we'd have to start all over. And every time it seems like he's uphill and you have to run uphill yeah. through this really dense brush, underbrush. And by the time I got to see this bird, uh, my legs are shaking so much from trying to run uphill and I'm breathing so heavy, I can't hold my binoculars still. So I, I saw the bird, but only got naked eye view. And then we went on to this little swamp where these elephants were reported to, to come for lunch, but we didn't see any elephants. But we did see this bird, the Grower's Swamp Warbler, another, another uh, not often seen bird. Well, Manny's back uphill on our way. Some scenes along the road. Every so often we would stop and bird, and we'd see things like uh, the dusky crimson wing, about the size of a finch. Oh, what just happened? Did we lose power? No, we closed. Okay, oh, the library closed out, oh, yeah. <laughs> the regal sunbird, beautiful bird. The Strange Weaver. Now, don't ask me why he's called Strange, but that's his name, the Strange Weaver. Cassin's Hawk Eagle. Now we'll go down to the very tip, Uganda. I wasn't all that impressed with this hotel until I got to my room. This was my living room. <laughs> this was my bedroom. Flowers on the towels. Man. But we're coming to the this uh Hinga Gorilla National Park where the silverback gorillas and the gold backed colobus monkeys 
are to be found, but we didn't see any of those. We were after birds. This volcano here uh, last erupted in, in 2013. So we were glad it wasn't erupting now. Mountain buzzard. Ruin Zori sunbird. Saffron finch. Another Turaco. <laughs> this is the Ruin Zori Turaco. All right, last stop. You know, when the British uh, colonized uh, Uganda, they said it was so lush, they expected it probably to be one of the richest countries in Africa, because it not only has wonderful farmland, but it also is very rich in minerals. Uh, but somehow that has never happened. Never became a wealthy country. Well, we got to our last place, and uh, the staff there was waiting for us. <laughs> and they quickly inspected our luggage. <laughs> Where I stayed. We're going to take another boat trip. Or apples. But it didn't take long. We came across this guy. And I took this picture really fast, so it's not very good focus. Uh, but this is an African fin foot. Okay, not a very common bird to find at all. And this is what he looks like on the water. And this is what he looks like out of the water. I mean, look at those feet. Incredible feet. We call them a fin foot because they've got little fins on the toes so that they act like webs. So when he paddles forward, those, those fins flare out and give him some traction in the water. Also had some animals, like zebra, topi in the background, Ugandan cob. Giant eland. This is a big, big animal. He stands about six foot. People always ask me, Do you see snakes? Well, almost, it's very uncommon to see snakes anywhere. But uh, this one we did see. This is a rock python alongside the road. And uh, we just stayed in this area until dusk, and after dusk, we got to see this guy. Oh. This is a pennant winged night jar. He's related to whippoorwills, um, but he's got these wonderful feathers that he trails out behind. And uh, really spectacular to watch. All right, now we're going to leave the park. On the way out, pass by a herd of Anjuli cattle. Look at the size of the horns of these cattle. And it's just unbelievable. And the people there, the farmers, are really proud of their cattle. All right, heading back towards Kampala. There's that guy. The library patron. The library will be closing in five minutes. If you have anything to check out, please do so at this time. Thank and you, and have a great night. Before we can get on the airplane, this is COVID time, you have to have a negative PCR test. So we had to stop the local hospital and get a test uh, in order to get on the airplane. And uh, we're tourists and they knew it. it, cost 200 bucks to get a PCR test here. But if you didn't have one, you didn't get on the plane. So, so that was it, that's the end. That's, that's all I got. So.
long were you in country? Three weeks. We were in country three weeks. Yes. Um, some of the pictures showed nets on the beds, all zipped yes. up. Zip, was that common in my? And, uh, was it common to see mosquito nets on beds? Yes, very common. Uh, during the season when we were there, it was not much of a mosquito problem, but there are other seasons where it really is. And uh, I've learned is if they've got mosquito nets, I use them. I don't want malaria. Yes. Some, since you've traveled to so many countries, do you have um, tour groups that you especially like and, and recommend, or do you just do such? A yeah, it it kind of depends on what kind of style birding you want to do. Uh, you know, there's there's the really relaxed style. You know, and there's some uh, uh, I don't know smaller birding groups that do that, where you just kind of take your time. And, you know, you're not worried about missing a bird here and there. You know, you, you just kind of, kind of have a good time seeing the birds. And then, and then there's the more hardcore variety. Okay, that, that's what I like. <laughs> and and the hardcore variety goes from from before dawn to after dusk, most days. And uh, and uh, they make an attempt to see as many birds as possible. Even some of the really hard skulking birds, they make an attempt at. Where some of the other companies won't do that because it just takes time. Yeah. So yes, and I, I often go with a company called BirdQuest. They're based out of England. Uh, sometimes I use Field Guides, which is based out of the United States. I've used Rock Jumper, which is based out of, well, they were out of South Africa, but they recently moved their offices to Mauritius. One more question. Yep. Oh, yeah. um, is there something that you wish you'd seen that you didn't get to see? Well, you always leave a few birds. You know, uh, there's nothing great that, that I missed. Uh, just, yes, I, I, we, there were some birds that we would like to have seen that we didn't see. You always have that. But the, the number of those is small. So I saw maybe 600 species on this particular trip. I mean, that's a lot of species. But maybe we missed maybe 10, 4. Yeah. Yes, sir. What performance more have you ever heard? What's the furthest north I've ever heard? Uh, uh, let's see, it'd be Fort Yukon, which is uh, north of the Arctic Circle in Alaska. No. Well, let's thank Steve again. Yeah. yeah.